Welcome to New York Bio's virtual breakfast series. A digital program started in 2020, bringing you fireside chats with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. This week's episode features Morris Oster, the Senior Vice President and Chief Legislative Counsel of MISNI. Going. My name is Jennifer hawks -Bland. I'm the CEO at New York Bio. Uh, we are very excited um, that you are joining us for our conversation with Mo Oster today. Um, a special thank you to Vertex for sponsoring this month's series of breakfast. Um, as always, housekeeping, please. We know you may have questions for Mo as we go through the conversation today. Please put those in the chat or the Q&A and we will get to them in due course. With that, I will kick it over to Derek to introduce our guest. All right, Mo, it is wonderful to have you here today. Uh, we get to talk about stuff today that is that's that's crucially important in New York Bio as the state affiliate of the biotech you know innovation organization and doing all things New York State. We get to talk to you about kind of your path to uh, where you are with the medical society, how you got there, and and what we think about the future. So we tend to kick these things off with a little bit of an origin story. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are? Well, first of all, I, I thank you very much for having me today. I'm really honored to be uh, invited to be part of it. I know we had our uh, Vice President, Dr. Yakubovitz, uh, be part of your panel a couple weeks ago, yeah. and it was, it was great and the importance of collaboration. But as for my origin story, I actually grew up in politics. My father was a political reporter um, in the Hudson Valley and covered the Ulster County Legislature for many years, and he used to pull me along, like basically force me to, you know, go along with them. But I, you know, to cut, you know, sit in, sit in these meetings, but through that process, I kind of, I guess, through osmosis became very interested in, in, in the political, in the political sphere. In college, I did an internship in the New York state Senate and then went to law school afterwards. Um, I then worked for a lobbying firm for, for a, for a short period of time where I actually, we subleased office space from the medical society. This was back in, you know, back in the mid nineties went to go work in the uh, New York State Assembly for a couple of years in the New York State Assembly Majority Leader's Office. Um, and frankly, you know, that, you know, in, in an area where we had, where we had to keep track of every single bill that was going out to the floor, the dynamics around each bill, who was in support of it, who was in, who was in favor of it. And that ultimately, I think, really provided me good, good, you know, good background and good training for when the Medical Society came to me in 1999 or 1998, and asked me to interview for a position over there, and 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 I've been over there since then. It's really been a it's really been a wonderful experience advocating for physicians. I always feel proud about what I'm working for. I always think about the idea that at I'm advocating for the people who are going to the emergency room at 2:30 in the morning to save someone's life. Yeah, and I that's something that drives me every day about making sure that what I'm doing is stand, you know, is, is, is making sure that they are able to do that so they can help assist the public. So that's yeah. kind of really my, uh, again, I've covered a lot in a very, you know, covered about 20 years in a, in a very short period of time, but uh, that's kind of how I got here. That's very efficient for a lawyer, Mo. <laughs> <laughs> We may we may wind the clock back in the face of legal expediency today to maybe to maybe <laughs> dig into that a little bit more. But before we get going, could you give maybe a little bit of background on the medical society? Just tell you know, give everybody kind of the 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 two minute overview. You know, what does it do? What are kind of the main causes and issues that you that you work on? And and that's a, we just get a little bit familiar with the uh, with the subject area, and then I'm going to make you go back in time. So. We are we are essentially the New York version of the AMA or the American Medical Association. We represent twenty thousand physicians all across the state of New York, in every type of practice: small practice physician, uh, large practice physician, hospital employed, academic medicine, primary care, specialty care, um, and 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 really and the breadth of issues that we that we cover it, it, we, it is, it is immense because frankly, New York is a very diverse state. The methods of practice where physicians are practicing are very diverse and the, and the chief interests of a lot of physicians are, are, are very diverse. We, we advocate a lot for reforms of health insurance. We, we advocate a lot for reforms of exorbitant, from exorbitant liability costs and certainly an immense amount of public health issues, like you know, such as 
immunization, um, availability of availability of medic of medications, um, and then of course, like every other group out, every other business group out there, there's always all kinds of um, adverse proposals you are perpetually fighting against. And frankly, as much as we have the goal of trying to advocate in certain areas, you inevitably you find yourself having to push back on you know against a variety of adverse budget proposals and other proposals which we believe would make it much harder for physicians to practice in this in, in, in the state of New York. But there is an immense volume of issues that we that we get involved in. Like I said earlier, I think the training that I had working in the assembly where we were responsible for understanding what's happening with all these different bills that are going out to the floor was was good for what I do now, which at any one time we I could be talking about three or four dozen different issues because of the diversity of our of our of our membership base and their interests. Yeah. But we would know nothing about negative uh, proposals coming out <laughs> of the legislature. That was tongue in cheek for anyone who is who is concerned. <laughs> yeah. So you know, it, so you got there in 1998, and you know, as as I myself will be 26 again this year, I remember a little bit about 1998. <laughs> Happy birthday! Uh, so, one of the things that's really interesting, you've been, you know, there for a long time, and and you've seen, I, I think, some some really exciting things in the healthcare landscape. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what it was like in what it was like in 1998 what were some of the big things that were in front of you and let's talk a little bit about how you know kind of things have changed over the years sometimes it's sometimes it's nice to kind of look at the things we've done and and look at how far we've come in a lot of different ways well i will what i will say is from the time that i started to now the 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 what i believe is the most significant change in our membership base is the nature of how they practice when I first came to the Medical Society back in 1998, an overwhelming uh, percentage of our members were in their own private practice. And, and that's always been sort of our core, like a lot of medical societies, our, our core membership base has been sort of the traditional privately owned physician practice, maybe you know leaning towards smaller practice. Now, New York's always had these very huge hospital systems, and we've always had physicians who are connected connected to it, but for the most part, those physicians were in a in a you know had privileges that those hospitals were not directly employed. So mm -hmm. they, for the most part, were their own bosses. Over time, because the of of the nature of the administrative challenges of medical practice, independent of just patient care delivery, um, and all the costs associated with that, more and more physicians have essentially, I'm not gonna say forced, but have made the choice that it, it was more practical um, for them to become employed by a large hospital system, to be employed by a large medical group or be employed by a medical group that is owned by a private or that is backed by a private equity group. And that has in many respects kind of put physicians in a, in, a, in a, while it's helped them, I think on some level with the, with the administrative challenges that they face, it's also put them in a position where they're essentially not their own bosses anymore and have all these other pressures. And you see this now with the, with, with, with the stats on burnout. Um, there's Physicians Foundation have done multiple surveys over the last couple of years where they say that 60% of physicians have experienced some symptoms of burnout um, in the, over the last year. And that's grown from, I think, pre-COVID, pre it was only 40%. And there's, again, it can be ascribed to any number of different sources, but sort of the usual, you know, the sort of the usual ones have been, you know, you know, EHR, you know, managing their EHR and the constant need for what they call pajama time. Um, after you, you've, you're done seeing patients for the day, but you need to then spend another two hours after that updating your charts to make sure the information is, is, is updated from all, from all of your visits. And frankly, keeping track of all the information that comes in about various patients tests that you need that you need to be aware of there's all these different requirements coming from the federal government um for medicare under the um uh, you know for the Me medicare value based payment program where you have to enter all this data to help otherwise you're going to end up having your medicare payments be medicare payments be cut or if you're employed you're not going to meet your hot your your, your hot your hospital 
um, targets for all that you know for, uh, that they that they are expecting you to achieve. So those constant pressures to kind of document, 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 really are leading to this accelerated burnout trend. And for some physicians, it's become it's gotten so bad. Physicians have a much higher rate of suicide than almost I believe any other profession, which because it's gotten because it's gotten to be so pressure filled. It was always obviously pressure filled. But the sort of the and we all experience it to one level or another, the the inability to disconnect. Um, you know, you you know, you're still checking your email, you're still continuing to check your, you know, your electronic tools. But for, for physicians, it's become many physicians, it's become a way of life. And and frankly, what we are trying to advocate for to at least address some of these areas, such as health insurer requirements um, or excessive health insurer requirements that we think are adding on to this burnout trend. Are there, and because New York, I let's stick on this for a second, because New York is so geographically diverse, right, as as is your, you know, the membership and the spread of physicians, it, are you seeing geographic differences in that impact, or is it really across the board um, that you're seeing that this type of problem? I think it's really across the board. I yeah. think, I think, I think the nature, I do think that, you know, they're, they're within the health insurance worlds, I would say. There has tended to be more of a collaborative process between the physician, the health, frankly, not, I wouldn't say just physicians, the healthcare provider community and the health insurance community yeah. in sort of in, in the upstate markets, Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, Albany, um, versus the downstate market, which has tended to be much more adversarial. But maybe it's just because of the volume of physicians and the choices that health insurers may have in terms of trying to choose certain certain physicians to be part of their panels versus upstate markets where where they're less so you so there needs to be more of a you know needs to be more of a of of, of kind of a collaborative model which is not to say you don't have some adverse you know some conflict and you know between you know, up there which we're also responding to as well there's just yeah. tended to be more of a collaborative model in the upstate markets than there's been downstate hmm. that's interesting yeah, do that you, is Go ahead, do you I was going to say, do you find, because one thing that we talk about a lot, right, because obviously New York Bio has, um, we have members, right, of all sizes, right? So ours aren't individual or practice groups. Ours are, right, like companies, right, of large companies, small companies. But in New York, we have a lot of very early stage companies. And we mm -hmm. often talk about how New York Bio pays attention to the policy um issues that in the end will enable them if the policy pathway is there for their therapeutics or diagnostics or treatments or devices to get approved and have a reimbursement structure right so to get to patients we pay attention to the things that they don't um they don't even know they need to pay attention to how much of that do you see with the physician community where you're paying attention to policy issues and these types of things and it's almost like they don't you're helping them to make sure they can continue to practice medicine without their even knowing that there might've been a threat there, right? Like how, how much of that do you see? Well, that, 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 that like I mentioned before, 75% of my advocacy time, I think is spent on, on, on fighting adverse proposals. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, sometimes it's various mandates on medical practice, which are always certainly well-meaning and meant to, meant to address some kind of maybe perceived gap in healthcare delivery, but oftentimes add unnecessary work, you know, or at least in terms of demonstrating compliance with that with with that mandate with with that mandate. Other times, it's like what we're facing in the middle of right now, and which frankly physicians are aware of about threats to expand liability. New York has by far and away the highest medical malpractice insurance premium costs in the country. Um, it's like not even close. I think we're twice, twice as high as the, as the state with the second highest amount, which is Pennsylvania. Um, you, you have neurosurgeons in Long Island and that pay $300,000 a year for their medical malpractice insurance coverage. And again, and while, like I mentioned before, some physicians are one step insulated by being employed, that also puts pressures on all the hospitals because they're the ones taking on this liability. And that means they can't affect, they can't maybe give that money back to their employed physicians or invest in that equipment or invest in the other medical staff that will help address patient care. Yet, despite all these pressures, 
We are now again facing, we faced it last year, a bill that passed both houses of the legislature, and I'm not, it may have an impact upon the biotech world as well, I'm not, I'm not sure, that would, that would significantly expand the types of damages that are awardable in wrongful death actions, um, which, you know, and, and again, like a lot of these ideas are certainly very well-meaning and, and, and put at forward the best intentions about addressing maybe some perceived gap in our in our civil justice laws. The problem is they also have an adverse impact upon healthcare delivery. That bill, if it was to be enacted, would require physicians to have to incur a 40% increase in their medical malpractice insurance premiums. So if you are a OBGYN group in Long Island that pays $200,000 a year for medical malpractice insurance and, and they're and they're and they're and they're five and they're five of them a 40% increase basically would amount, you know, a 40% increase would basically amount to a $400,000 increase in that group's medical malpractice insurance premiums. It's not tenable. It's not, it's not, yeah. it's not something that these groups can take on and continue to expect to, expect to offer healthcare services to the public. Last year. Ask, yeah. I was going to say, I was just going to ask a dumb question, which is, you know, why? Right. How are how is New York's? I realize we're twice as good as everyone else at everything, but you know, why are we twice as expensive? How what it what is it about New York that that can possibly make us this expensive? Well, I mean, again, I do think one part of it is our we do have higher costs than every other state in in, in the country, but I do think but we it's have not two X, right? Have, it's it's more, not double. Have, right. And we have more trial lawyers than every other any other state in the country, I believe. I, I don't know that. For a fact, but we also have very unique rules for our civil justice system, where you can't find out who the expert witness who's going to be testifying you in a medical liability action, and you don't you don't know that. Um, I think what happens is that, and we don't have like many many other states across the country, have taken steps to limit limit their awards um, and find ways to have rules that I think are at least make the system a little fairer. Um, than, than New York does. Um, you know, there's about 30 states that have enacted some form of limitation on damages in medical malpractice lawsuits, or they have rules that require before a court case gets in, get, gets into court, you have to have an expert certify that there is a reasonable basis for this lawsuit to go forward. Um, or you can have to have the same, the, the same specialty physician um, be an expert witness at a medical malpractice trial, or you have some type of specialized courts. New York is none of these, yeah. um, or have they have variations? It's, it's in a very, very flimsy. It's in a very, very flimsy way. So all these factors taken together have made New York this extraordinarily expensive state in, um, for a whole host of areas, but but specifically for medical malpractice insurance. Now, again, you you know, but then you have these scenarios where you find these sort of one-off situations. And now this bill I was talking about that would expand liability is not just for medical malpractice. It's for any type of any type of um, defendant, um, and so essentially, what it would do is expand wrong damages and wrongful death awards to include emotional damages for the for the for this for the survivors, which again, at its face, seems like a very compelling um, idea for you know for somebody to embrace. But there are downstream consequences. There's all these downstream consequences. Of 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 taking this of taking this action, and again, you put that on top of a system. Uh -oh. I really wanted to see where he was going with that. Okay. <laughs> Mo, you've locked up. If you yep. can hear us, I think I froze. Oh, there you go. You're back. You're back. back. Okay. Yes. Where did you I stop? Cut off as you were putting. You were putting something on top of a system. You were right there. You were at the crescendo. Yeah. You were gonna yeah. hit so, the next so one, and then you just stopped. On top of a, on, on top of an already very unstable, a very unstable system, and the and the and the and that's why the governor vetoed the bill last year. But again, it's not just on the healthcare system. Right. It's on every. It's on every business. It's on every municipality. The municipality, the New York State Conference of Mayors has ardently opposed this bill. The New York State Business Council has ardently opposed this bill. Um, frankly, if you're if you're the insurance industry has, I think the it's it's estimated that this bill would actually drive up your 
auto insurance premiums by 10%, which already you've seen that there's been record increases in auto insurance as a result of a whole host of factors, including you know relating to inflation. So it, it this bill would be would be extremely bad for for healthcare delivery in New York State because of the cost imposition on physicians and hospitals, which inevitably would will impact access to care. But it's also going to adversely impact every other industry in the state of New York and every consumer who relies upon that industry because it's going to drive up their costs immensely. Ouch. Uh, <laughs> so one of the things that we that, that Jennifer and I talked about in, in terms of kind of how to frame a few things today is, you know, obviously, you know, COVID has an enormous effect on, you know, what we've, we've thought about in, in the late legislature and the budget over the past few years. And now, you know, I believe we are actually, you know, entering a new, you know, era where we we you know the stimulus money is 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 running out what do we look like from a budget standpoint and what kind of considerations do you think we're going to see you know over the next you know couple of years here it it sounds like we're in already a tough situation from a legislative standpoint in terms of new york and now it almost it only seems like it's going to get tougher with the the dwindling of the stimulus package i'm sorry if anybody else wanted to have a good day today but <laughs> no. we're we're the scary part of halloween <laughs> yeah <laughs> It's yeah, just, I mean, yeah, all, and, all and for so sure. I think our economy the last couple of years kind of had a steroid injection of like of money from the federal government that frankly spared us from having to make some difficult choices, which was good. I mean, because there are a number of positive things that the state has has done, frankly, which we strongly supported about expanding health insurance coverage. Um, yeah, uh, on the for the essential for the essential plan, um, for postpartum for po additional Medicaid postpartum coverage. Um, for for women and families, um, so there's a lot of positive things that this new money um, has been able to do. We've been able to expand uh, loan repayment opportunities for for student for 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 young young physicians, um, and again, this is across a number of different areas. Um, I think the news got a little less bad yesterday on, on on New York State's budget because the budget director indicated that the that the budget deficit was only four and a half billion dollars, not nine billion dollars yesterday. So it got, right little, it got a little. Hey, that's little four and a half billion dollars, right? That's a win. Right. Yeah, that's a win. So yeah, and 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 so, but 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 there are a number of areas where we're, it is going to make things tougher. I mean, the state agencies were told they had to submit zero increased budgets, and that has all kinds of implication for any kind of entity that relies upon an increasing amount of resources every year. I mean, certainly our the hos our hospitals across the state, particularly those that serve underserved areas rely heavily upon state funding to um, for managing their un managing their uninsured patients um, and all and all kinds of other 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 areas. I mean, you know, could we face Medicaid cuts? The last couple of years, Governor Hochul has been terrific about trying to find ways to enhance payments across the board in the healthcare system. And she's and and we have one of the lowest Medicaid payment rates in the country. And she's provided additional resources to ink to you know not not make it great but it certainly has made it more positive we went from 60 percent of medicare to 70 percent of medicare to 80 percent of medicare um 100 percent of medicare is still woefully inadequate as we continue to fight in the federal level but at least it's it's these are meaningful steps to try and increase increase um an, an investment in 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 uh in public programs to then make sure that all that patients of the public can get the care they need by expanding the pool of physicians, they are able to, able to be treated by. So those are things that they've been the governor that the government government's been wanting to do that are going to become they're going to become much harder. And a specific example for for us, um, a couple specific examples for us, we have this I mentioned before with medical malpractice. There's a program that's been the New York State government for close to forty years called the Excess Medical Malpractice Insurance Program. It provides physicians with a an additional million dollars of medical malpractice coverage above the the one million dollars or one point three million dollars they'll purchase them for themselves, mm -hmm. and every kind of in that like that was funded with like a seventy five million dollar appropriation of the budget. A couple during leading up as we were going through some tough times in the pandemic when when Cuomo was the governor, he tried multiple times to try and cut the funding for it and make the physicians have to actually pay for this coverage. Physicians absolutely need this coverage. 
if or an act tort reform, an act find some way to bring down the damages. I, given the dynamics in our state, I, I don't. I think it's going to be a very hard ask, given the given the composition of our state legislature. That's probably not that likely. Um, so this fund, this program has been essential for helping stabilize what is already a very very uh, uh, difficult area. But and if they're going to make physicians have to pay for it, they're not going to pay for it. They're just going to you know, get out and leave. They're not gonna, they're not gonna, they're not gonna, they're not gonna stay here for that. Other areas, which I think frankly will impact upon your industries, um, is we've been fighting for years um these proposals that would put additional prior authorization requirements for medications provided to Medicaid patients Medicaid patients. They the so-called prescribe protecting prescriber prevails. prevails. <laughs> in yeah. every in every in every year there's a proposal in the budget that would say that the doctor no longer has the final say. It's it's up to the state, or it's up. It, it, you know, it's it's up to now. It's up to the state because it's all being done by the state. Um, and and so that would be that would be extremely problematic. It would add a, an additional layer of burden to patients getting the medications they need, and one more factor that would drive drive physician burnout through what could be nonsensical bases for you know determining whether patients get the medications they need. So there's all these areas where. You, you could see when you have tight budgets where there could be downstream consequences on on all the on ultimately which will impact patients, but placing additional burdens on physicians and hospitals and other healthcare providers and frankly industries that that help support them by providing medications that these patients rely upon. Mo, can you talk because obviously like our members are right across the board there. Are they're early, you know, they're in early stage companies, they're in large companies, they're in academia. Can you talk a little bit about um, sort of how the New York budget process works? We talk a lot about the budget, um, right, and how that works. But and, and I think that's different, especially if they're coming from different states. It, it, we have so much policy tied up in yeah. our budget process in New York. Can you talk a little bit about that for folks? Yeah, and 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 that is, and that's what's interesting when I when I go and speak at national meetings and they're talking about their budget processes and they're and they're always a scratch and they're like, really like how can they put that policy in the budget? That's nothing to do with but well, that's just the way our budget works. The the our state constitution gives enormous power to the governor to uh to develop budgets and and in and gives the legislature only very limited power in which to change it. Technically speaking, there the legislature is only allowed to change the monetary amount. They're not allowed to technically change the policy. And so every year the governor will come forward with a budget, and then the budget, which consists of tens of thousands of pages of various of various text, um, they'll there'll be all these different policy items that are placed into it, and then it becomes a dance between the legislature and the governor. Um, about how to whether, about how to make changes, how to make changes to that process, and the legislature will come forward. They'll pass their own what they call one house budgets that really set forth their own priorities. Um, but then they get then they get into this negotiation with the governor's office, and ultimately, if they agree upon something, the governor has to then it's ultimately the governor has to resubmit the bill because it has to technically come from the has to come from the governor. Um, and, 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 or they have to, at least they have to be, they have to be okay with it. And, and, and so this makes for, and this makes for sort of this like delicate dance. The governor also has the ability to basically force, if they get to the point where they get past April 1st and they're doing extenders, the governor theoretically could put their whole budget into one extender bill and force the legislature to choose between either shutting down the government or doing, or you know, we're doing what the governor wants. Now it doesn't get to that point, but that threat hanging over the head of the legislature really gives the governor enormous powers in in making in making policy. So as as much as legislatures want to do things, and ultimately they're, what their goal is to add more money, that's not necessarily what they always, you know, what they always do. But it's typically how the dynamic works because. Governors are typically using trying to find ways in which to conserve resources, and legislatures typically want to add on more to to address various needs of constituents um, and, and interest groups. Yeah. It's funny. I think that people don't. I think people are very aware of the sort of 
brinksmanship at the federal level, right, over over the funding of the mm-hmm. government. And, but I don't think people realize um, that. And I think this past session, we were past, right, the April 1 deadline, right? right? right. So I think people don't realize, too, that that does, it also can happen in, in states, it's happened in New York, um, and that makes uh, very much, and in, it incentivizes the legislators um, to to do, and for everyone and to talk do about, And you talk about, um, you know, differences from when I first, when I first, for the year I first came to work for the Medical Society, I think they passed the budget in August. Um, it was just in, it was, it was a, I think it was my last year in the assembly, actually 1998, they finished patch, passing the state budget in August and, and, and for years budgets would not, they'd get passed, ultimately be extenders. They'd pass it in June. They pass it in July. There was a court interpretation that even further expanded the governor's power. They also passed laws to say the legislators don't get paid until the budget gets finally passed. So now our budget process has become mostly more, you know, far more, far more collaborative. Even the days when we had Republican control of the state Senate, you'd obviously have some public bickering about items and people digging in on things. But compared to the federal government and compared to what it was, you know, 25 years ago, it's much more, it's much more collegial. Yeah, you know, because I think there is sort of a, governors don't want to, ultimately, there's, there's been enough attention to the issues of late budgets that the public sort of associates that with competence. So governors don't want to have late budgets because they also know that the public will hold them accountable as in being incompetent if that happens. Again, I wish the federal government had a similar, because to me, even more rise in the federal government, because we're talking about credit, you know, debt limits, that things that really impact all these other areas of, of like banks lending money and all these other areas that I think are probably are even as important as the issues we deal with in New York in the New York budget are far more profound. And so it's even scary the level of brinksmanship you have on a federal level. It makes New York look like a kindergarten class. I mean, compared, you know, compared to, you know, for as acrimonious as as we can be, yeah. it really has become much more collegial generally over the last, you know, you know, you know, with some some little bumps here and there, but for the most part, it's certainly compared to the federal government. I mean, it's interesting, uh, you know, it, and, I, and I say this because, you know, New York's had, to, up until five years ago, we've always had divided government. And, and you know, you'd go to, you'd go and have lunch in the Capitol cafeteria and you'd see, you know, the Democratic staffers were talking to the Republican staffers. They all knew each other. They all, they all like, you know, were, you know, friendly with each other. Maybe they weren't always the best of friends or maybe they were. But there was always a level of collegiality that went along with it, despite sort of the policy differences. You don't see that in Washington. Like there is, there is a lot of hate between the parties and the and the, and, and even even among the staffs down there. It's just a different. It's a different world, and maybe some of that kind of spills over into our budget making process as well too. That people just found a way to have lunch together and realize how much more they had in common. Then maybe there would be less acrimony. Yeah, it's interesting. So I work, and some people obviously know this, but I worked in the uh, in the U.S. Senate, right, in the mid late nineties, and um, I we worked. Um, I worked for a Mississippi senator, and we worked across the aisle. We had, I mean, it didn't really matter. But one of his favorite people to work with on arts and education issues was Ted Kennedy, right? Mm-hmm. And today, you would not see a Republican senator from Mississippi working with a very liberal senator from Massachusetts, right? It just it's changed a lot. And I've even said, um, you know, for my kids, like, I don't think that that would be a very fun environment to have as kind of your first, you know, job out of, out of undergrad, no matter how interested in politics and policy, you know, you are. Right. And, and, and I think, and I think it's unfortunate because again, we, in some respects, we sort of lost the ability to disagree without being disagreeable. And, and granted, I think social media, has been an accelerant. I think there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of like, you know, playing to the audience that, you know, anything positive you say about someone who's perceived to be your opponent could be used against you on, you know, in a campaign ad and in in, in a, uh, and in a, you know, on, on social media. And so that kind of, kind of pernicious influence of that kind of has really put a pall over a lot of, a lot of politics because, 
you know, people no longer worry about, um, you know, we're getting into areas that are going beyond healthcare, but I do think they, I think yeah. they do back into policy because that kind of fear about being reelected does shape the policy when people are scratching their head, like, why do they pass that? Well, this person was afraid of getting primary to their, to their left or their right. And I think, frankly, New York has now become that. You know, I think you saw a dynamic on the national level where a lot of Republicans were, a lot of mainstream Republicans were losing, um, losing their primary elections to people to the right of them. And I think in New York, you've seen that dynamic where, where a lot of Democrats are losing, like a long, long-standing Democrats are like losing primaries to the people to the left of them. And for example, the, the, the Assembly Insurance Committee chair, who had been Kevin Cahill, who had been who had been a long-standing assembly member, lost it, her his primary in 2022 to an upstart, to a socialist, and in Kingston, not even the city, like in 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 this Hudson Valley, in this Hudson Valley district, um, it just goes to show you that that's something that would have never happened 30 yeah. 30 years ago. It's just a a dynamic of of where we live now, where so often you get pulled. Um, you get pulled, you know, you, you get pulled to the, you know, towards your party's polar ends as opposed to in the middle towards compromise. Um, and and so it's something that, again, I think I, I, I think, you know, over the time, I think, you know, creative tension has led to some really good policy. Sometimes it's led to some head scratching policy, but I think oftentimes that creative tension between, you know, between the parties has actually led to some Led, led, you know, led to some, led to some good policy. And I'll give an example: the child health insurance program. Back, mm -hmm. it was initially, and you know, put forward by the Assembly Health Committee Chair back in the '90s and 2000s and 2010s, Dick Gottfried. But then it was embraced by George Pataki, a Republican, as a right. way to provide health insurance coverage to children. So an idea that it was kind of on the Bill Clinton, um, um, you know, triangulation aspect of like finding kind of center issues. That allow you to do positive yeah. things, sort of warming your reputation, or maybe being viewed as more bipartisan. That maybe you don't see it as as often now, you know, because of kind of the the, the pull, the, you know, the polls of the party wings. Yeah, and I think that you know, and one thing that's important for for people too, for our members and your members, right, to understand is that as a trade association representing a lot of different sort of even viewpoints we work with everybody, right? So it's really important that there is no, like we are, you know, we are Switzerland when it comes to not our positions on policies, but politics, right? So um, so we we work with everybody. And I, I did plug in um, to the chat for everybody, an initiative that I thought was interesting that came out um, fairly, I think this fall, maybe in September, um, the Spencer Cox, the Utah governor, is chair of the National Governors Association right now, and they have um, launched a um, initiative called Disagree Better. Right, it's talking about how to have right, like how to have how to have conversations, how to disagree, and but yet it doesn't mean that each side is bad or right. Like so, I think that there are times when we need to be reminded of this. So I thought that was a um, a really nice um, initiative. Um, and maybe, maybe it doesn't need to just be governors. Maybe it needs to be mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of different people learning to disagree better. <laughs> yeah. I, and, and it's, and it's really, like I said, it's an, it's an unfortunate development in, in, in politics today. Cause I can think of so many times when, you know, really good policy was developed by a person from the opposite party, developing something that you would associate with the flip side. I think, I think about Andrew Cuomo, one of the biggest things that he did, I think, is one of the most far-reaching, far-reaching policies he helped push through was a tax cap in New York State. Now, again, nothing to do with health care, um, but it is something if you live in the state of New York and you knew every year that your local property taxes were going up by five percent, six percent, and that kind of put put a much put made it much harder for municipalities to increase taxes um, above two or three percent based upon whatever that cap level was set at each year. So again, but it was an example of a of a of a governor or a policymaker sort of going to the going to the middle and finding something that was perceived to be in the in the broader interests in the broader interests of of everybody. And again, I realize now I'm beginning to get further tilted away from the healthcare field, 
but I do think it's I, I do think it's something that's kind of been lost a little bit over time. That's sort of you know the, the idea of a sort of a shared a shared sacrifice, a shared like hey I give some I'll give up something and you'll give something, but we'll make things better for everybody. It's negotiation. Yes. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And and ultimately, if we're here, if we're here to think about patients, right? It helps no one if the de facto, if the if if the only things that are going to get passed to help patients, you know, come with some super unassailable majority that you know somebody can push through, and then we have to trust that whoever has that unassailable majority has come up with actual good legislation to help to help patients. And frankly, a lot of stuff could probably be helped for you know long term benefit by having the perspective of you know, the other side of the table so that it isn't, uh, you know, a remarkably, you know, lopsided, you know, bill, because most of the time, you know, most of the time, our instincts on foresight are wrong, they might be directionally correct, but it's very rare that we actually get it right the first time. Right. Well, and, and that's the thing is, is, is once you enact the policy, you then establish a base, though, you then establish something for which you can then adjust, you think about the Medicare prescription drug benefit and the steps they've taken to try and you know, to try and, you know, increase that or, you know, the, you know, the ideas of like, you know, health, in, various health insurance initiatives, you establish it, and then you find ways to enhance it, whether it's the, you know, our health insurance exchange in New York State, or our essential plan, and maybe you find some gaps in it, like you find that people, you know, even though it's, even though you charge them, you know, a, a nominal premium, they don't pay it. And so they get kicked off the coverage. Well, why are we continuing to require them to have to pay this amount if they're going to get kicked off when we can easily just cover that nominal amount and they won't get kicked off? So, you know, those like those kinds of things where you you, you establish the policy and then you go in and make corrections afterwards as, as, as time goes along. Can we talk a little bit about so like and so for for everyone, right, like so we work. We as New York Bio and and sort of the the industry, right? The life sciences industry. We work closely with you all on some issues. Some issues just are more scope of practice issues. And so, um, talk to us about your work around um, immunizations and vaccines, because I know we with COVID, obviously, if you didn't have children, like all of a sudden you were thinking about vaccines. Otherwise, you might have been thinking about you know childhood vaccines and doing that through the doctor's office. But now with COVID, we had so many vaccines proffered in all kinds of settings. Talk to us about how you all see vaccinations moving forward and the policy around um, access to those. Well, I mean, I think, you know, we're, we're evolving from a world where a lot of the vaccines were done in physician offices to where they're being done in, far, done in, 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 in pharmacy locations. And, they've, and we haven't loved that idea of you know or you know of, about it but it's kind of the nature of where things have, have become however one thing that doesn't change is our strong support for vaccinations as a way in which to help minimize public health threats we were involved in a couple of years pre-pandemic i think it was 20, 2018 2019 new york for many years had a law that allowed exceptions for children's immunization school immunizations for not only for medical contraindications, of course, but also religious objections. And it was clear at a certain point that it was really getting abused. And people were really kind of making flimsy ways in which to justify objections to that. We work with a number of public health authorities the New York State Association of County Public Health Officials, various healthcare provider groups, various, re re various groups based in 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 re, in religious promotion, ref, refua, not orthodox, an Orthodox Jewish group, but that strongly supported um, um, vaccinations um, to eliminate this religious exception to um, schools immunization requirements. And we faced a lot of pushback. There was really some of the most some of the most crazy protesting I've ever seen. People yelling things at legislators and in you know under on the you know from the from the overlook where you can watch the proceedings really saying vile things to legislators and and in literally most most votes in Albany are once a bill comes up for vote it's going to pass yeah. rarely do you have a situation where you don't know what's going to happen this was a situation where you didn't know what was going to happen for sure and it was a it was a huge effort to get that important public policy enacted but ultimately it was and and we were proud to have been a major part 
in that in in in, in the alliance of groups that help kind of make that happen because it's so important for children to be children to be immunized and frankly for when children are immunized to prevent the spread of disease to everyone else who they who, who they live with i mean we've you know certainly we, we we faced a lot of blowback from a lot of people about covid vaccinations because we supported a mandate for healthcare workers for covid for healthcare workers to be to be immunized against covid and not surprisingly there are a lot of there are a lot of healthcare there are a lot of healthcare workers who protested where there were lawsuits we worked with the american medical association in in putting forward amicus briefs to help support new york state's point of view because again the idea that immunization helps helps save lives um we've eradicated diseases because of because of immunization and it's unfortunate now we're getting into a world where frankly because of again bring it back to politics where immunizations are not being followed i mean not only are covid immunizations down there's also flu immunizations rsv all these different important diseases diseases is important to immunize against that are people aren't people aren't doing it because people have questioned the science of immunizations which is just insane to me because you think back about a hundred years ago, and you know, and, and diseases that that killed people. You think back fifty years ago, you still had measles, and everyone had like measles and mumps, and you know, some had rubella, and there were these bad outbreaks. Yeah. And we are in polio, and we've been able, we had been able to basically eradicate these diseases or greatly yeah. lessen them, and now they're coming back because because there's this anti-science bent that's out in the in in some elements of the public right now that's hard to push back against. Yeah, yeah. There, we've had measles outbreaks in New York, right, in the last few years. I mean, some pretty significant ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And again, I and and so it's it's something for which we, not just us, but we, you know, it, import importantly, we find that in order for us to achieve policy items, we need to work with allied groups. We need to work with, and and I've I've found over the years that everyone is your you know, everyone is your is your opponent on some issue and your ally on the others. I'll give, you know, for mentioned scope of practice before, yeah. but there are a lot of times, you know, for some of these public health initiatives, we work closely with the nurse practitioners and the physician assistants or right. there are areas we've, you know, where, you know, and, and so, you know, there are areas where we've just sought to partner with groups when it's the right thing to do. We know there's going to be issues where we're going to be in conflict with each other. Listen, I've, in the pharma world, we've always done, we've always partnered with pharma and bio, but there have been issues where we've been on opposite sides of the, yeah. and it's just the nature of the political process, because more often than not, when it's the right thing to do, you, you don't care who your ally is. Yeah. And and so, and again, and, and on that level, and I think I really, as, as I look at the time, I realize I haven't even gotten it all into our discussion of one of the most important things we work on, which is reform of health insurer practices. And I think about and it made me think of that because of all the different patient advocacy groups that we work with on that front, um, in, you know, including the Bleeding Disorders Coalition, the Multiple Sclerosis Society, the Cancer Society, and there's a number of initiatives that we've worked proactively with them on addressing their bar the barriers they face on getting coverage for various for various treatments, um, whether we're talking about prior authorization or copay accumulators or step therapy rules. Where again, I just want to emphasize how, how important it is in in Albany and in and and Washington to some extent because I have a little foot in, foot in the Washington world as well about about developing allies to you know for getting for getting items done because while we may have credibility, we have much cred greater credibility if other groups agree with us. Yeah, and sometimes they right like, and I think also legislators and staff, let's be fair, staff, <laughs> appreciate when th that in sometimes, right, like you are going, the medical society will agree with our uh, pharma biotech companies, but they want others. And knowing that you're taking positions on the issues, not just against or for some other particular type of group actually gives you more credibility. Absolutely. Well, again, and, and, I, and I think as as much as anything that ultimately the groups that have the highest credibility are the patient advocates and yes. not in a super fit, not when, not when they have a superficial, like add their name, but when they are the ones who are actually leading the charge on, on specific issues. So it's very important to have them be at, you know, have them 
identify, work with them on their issues, work, you know, find out what their issues are and, and, and advocate for them. And then kind of, and through that, you can then educate those groups about the concerns that you have. And then hopefully you, those, those overlap with each other. So again, that you can help develop these strategic partnerships that help lead to good policy outcomes. I imagine with the rise of patient advocacy groups, I think they become much more organized, certainly much more informed, a lot more vocal and really in tune with, you know, kind of the the needs and and the hope for a lot of different patient groups. You know, do you find that that dialogue from a legislative standpoint has become more productive over the last five or 10 years? Do you do you kind of see that now as something that is, you know, kind of commonly done and, and really accepted practice? Do you see that as as helping patients? Well, I, I think the desire to help patients has always been, you know, I, I think that's always been there among among legislators. I think that's always sort of been their first and foremost, you know, for or, you know most of them, most the first and foremost concern. I think I think some of the groups have become much better at at honing their messages and taking advantage of like of not taking advantage, but like you know, maximizing the use of like social media. And and going to and going to the media to report on their on their items to really get legislators' attention because again I think so one more thing I've, I've you know as we get towards the end I haven't really even brought up the use of kind of media to help kind of be also sort of the message maker in your in in what you in what you advocate for because there's a level of objectivity associated with it as opposed to an advocate so I think some you know some of the some of some of the patient advocacy groups have become excellent. At, at being able to generate, I think of the American Cancer Society and their efforts on sm on anti smoking and you know addressing you know um, vaping products and the and how they and how they use the and how they you know in get themselves involved with the media to try and make sure the public is aware of what they are trying to achieve. Um, we certainly you know we'll do a lot of op eds or we'll join with various groups on you know we you know we you know we'll join with various groups in press conferences as well because i think as much as anything is when something gets reported on in the news it tends to be perceived um more objectively as a, as an issue to be addressed than if, if the advocate is making that point themselves mm -hmm. yeah and how do you find that um it, because we we work obviously very closely with patient advocacy groups and research like disease research foundations and those focused on not only access to care but also finding cures and treatments right um, how have you found working with, do you work with a larger volume of organizations now? Because I find that New York seems to have a lot of organizations that exist here. A lot of the national organizations have, are headquartered, you know, in New York, um, but also they have state chapters or local chapters or different groups. How have you found, what is the most efficient way um, that you all work with um, a broad group of patient stakeholders? I have found it's it's kind of I'm not sure it's it, it's any more. I, I found it sort of the process by which to be random. Typically, <laughs> it's a result of a campaign for which we know uh, you know a lobbyist or a person who coordinates their advocacy and and through them, we get to be familiar with that particular group. I think about step there when we pass when we work together to help pass a, a bill, you know, last couple or last couple you know step therapy. And then on preventing mid-year formulary changes, um, where we really began to work very closely with a number of other groups I mentioned before, the Bleeding Disorders Coalition, Multiple Sclerosis Society, can you know cancer you know cancer society, um, and, and and other groups. But it was because of specific campaigns where we happened to be we were happened to be introduced to the to those groups, and through those groups we started meeting right you know we started meeting regularly. So. I think sometimes it may it may dip and go rise based upon the specific campaigns that you're in the middle of. So I'm not sure if it's something that's it's necessarily increased over time. I think it's sometimes an issue specific and and becoming associated with certain groups based upon the campaign that you're in the middle of. Yeah. All right. So we have you have about three and a half minutes left. I am going to ask you um, the magic ball, the, the magic ball question. So you have a you, you have your. Um, your magic ball for next legislative session. When we get to June, what do you hope to have accomplished 
um, through the legislative session for your members? So the top issue that we would that we well, I should say there's a there's a there's a there is a overriding issue that we would like to see, which is to allow physicians, privately practicing physicians, to collectively negotiate with health insurance plans. I don't know. I think that's what's obviously been a core. It's been a core issue for years. I th we understand that there's some pushback in the idea, that idea, but short of that idea, I think what we'd like to see is fundamentally, you know, two, two things: prepayment, one prepayment, one postpayment. One is addressing excessive prior authorization hassles. We we've seen all kinds of studies about 80% of physicians have said that the that the number of prior authorizations have gone up in the last three to five years immensely. I started before by talking about burnout. We want to see ways by which those can come down. We have a bill um, that's sponsored by Senator, Senator Breslin and Assemblyman Weprin that would, well, two different bills. One, the first would make sure that we prohibit repeat prior authorization. So if you're stable on a medication, you don't have to every year go get reapproved by that insurer for that medication. Too many physicians have to do that for very serious diseases. And it's in, you know, I know what the, a urologist who told me there's a, there's a prostate cancer drug that their patient stabilized on. He has to get, he has to get pre, he has to get that pre, that pre, pre approval reauthorized each year. The other area that we're seeing is, and this really fundamentally affects smaller practice physicians, is health insurers have learned how to master the game about timing of payment. They, there are rules and there's prompt payment laws in New York State where you have, you have to pay within 30 days, but they can, they can they can delay that if you know it's not reasonably clear and they do that by say, asking for additional medical records but now they do it for every every physician now they do it for every they this they 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 wholesale they wholesale to start stop paying claims while they're waiting to get medical records they even make it difficult they force people to mail as opposed to using electronic systems they force physicians to mail records and can you believe that in 2023 you're having to mail things and and so and and for a lot of practices, it's really affecting their ability to keep staff to stay open. We have bringing these complaints to the Department of Financial Services, but we would like to see some type of greater regulation um, legislation from the legislature that puts greater penalties on insurance companies for these for basically these frivolous delays of paying claims. So those are really kind of the the most significant most significant items that we would like to see get passed get passed in the next legislative session. Well, honestly, we could have just spent an hour on that. Um, <laughs> listen, Mo, Mo, it's been wonderful to have you here this morning. This has been fantastic. These are these are, these are issues that we don't tend to think about every single day, but this affects everything we do. It affects our patients, and it certainly affects the way our, our industry develops uh, therapeutics and, and cures. So, Thank you very much for uh, for joining us today. Your your Halloween costume is fantastic. You kind of fit with with Jennifer and I's call I'm not a Halloween. Doctor, costume. But I play one on TV. It's it's <laughs> exactly. you know it's 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 in the Spirit Halloween store as webinar hosts and guests, and yes. it looks fantastic. <laughs> yes. You even got the Zoom background yep. behind you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> everybody else, I hope you have a wonderful Halloween. Mo, thank you again for joining us, and thanks to Vertex for sponsoring. <laughs>